Well, hey, friends, it's good to be here. Man, it's been a while. Ooh. Hey, we're going to um, drop into the middle of sort of this big transition that's happening in the, in the story of the Bible. Um, if you're not as maybe familiar with some of these stories, I'll give you a quick synopsis. There's been this people that God has chosen. We, we call them the Israelites, or you maybe know the you know, Jews. And there's really nothing special. <laughs> like, he didn't pick them because he goes, ooh, those are some nice people. I want them. We don't really know. He just kind of ran. It seems to me he randomly picked them. Um, but anyhow, so the, a lot of the first part of the Bible is this story of God sort of always showing up for them. And it's a great story. However, they had been promised this, this real estate, okay? Hey, and something happened, we won't get into that, and so they have to take a detour. It's a 40-year detour. And a guy named Moses, you've heard his name, a guy named Moses who was their leader, who had done unbel- amazing acts of faith and, and power and courage through God, um, he, he doesn't get to go in. And so we're picking up this story right as he's died. And now there has been this group of people who have been walking through the desert for 40 years, waiting for this moment. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. I just want you to know that Joshua isn't going, what? He died? Who didn't tell? It isn't about information here. There's something that God is sort of reinforcing here. He's making a point. He's not wasting any words. Moses is dead. Now, therefore, arise Go over this Jordan, that's a river, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, that's going to be your territory. No man, no person shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I'll not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only, be strong and very courageous being careful to do all that the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. and Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I had a very interesting Friday night I want to tell you about. So I had to, I've been really struggling for the last three months with being just super tired, just fatigued, and I've, uh, I don't, you know, we've tried to make some change in some of my meds. We've, um, done all kinds of stuff, and I just, I mean, I could go to sleep, you know, any moment. Um, I wake up a little tired, go to bed tired. Anyhow. Keep going, Carl. All right, got this tray. Um, so anyhow, I went to the, finally, I, finally, after three months, because I'm sharp, I went to the doctor. And they, uh, you know, she's checking me out and all, and she goes, yeah, well, let's just take an EKG, just, just to be safe. So, no problem. So, um, get the EKG done. She goes, uh, you know what, just hang out just a second. I like to get the EKG sort of double-checked with somebody else. And I'm going, 
oh, you're lying to me. Because <laughs> I've had an EKG here before, and you didn't do that. And so I'm sitting there thinking. So she comes and sits by me, and <laughs> she goes, well, I want, look, you see this? Which is no help to me. It's just, you know, looks like a polygraph, right? Um, and it looks like I lied at some point. Because she says that there's, a, there's, a, there's an anomaly, a glitch. And I go, oh, that's all right. She goes, well, you're going to have to go to the ER. Um, okay. <laughs> I said, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I, and I'm, I, you, you probably have figured out as I was reading the passage that we're going to probably talk about courage, right? You, you kept hearing this, courage, don't be afraid, show up. And I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you, I'm really not that afraid to die. And this was kind of freaking them out a little bit. I said, well, where do you want me to go? She, she knew it wasn't exactly a heart attack, so she said I could drive someplace close. I said, all right, I used to visit, when I was a pastor, I would visit all kinds of hospitals. My favorite hospital was Avista because they have unbelievable food. They have the best food. I'm just telling you, they have great food. And so I said, well, I'm going to Avista. And I told her, I said, and if I'm going to die, I'm going to get a chocolate shake on the way. Because I'm telling you right now, if I die and don't get one more chocolate shake, I'm going to be a little irritated. And there, you can see, she's kind of concerned. And I said, you know, honestly, my bucket list is full. I've not been a bucket list kind of person. I had, the only bucket list I really had is I wanted my kids to be successful adults, and I was hoping that they would be in loving relationships with their spouse. And i got to tell you, my kids' spouses love my children way better than I ever did, and what that means to me. And then, honestly, I wanted a granddaughter. And that's my list. I told them, I'm, I'm fine. My wife's young and pretty. She'll be fine. She'll be wearing, you know, red dress and heels at the, at the funeral. It's not a big deal. <laughs> and so, I went to the hospital, went to the ER. Now, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not afraid I'm really not afraid of dying. That doesn't mean I'm not a person who struggles with fear. So, you know, I went through all the testing, and they said I could go home. I just have to go see a cardiologist. Probably shouldn't wait three months, but we'll see. But <laughs> this is really weird. I, I was a little disappointed that they didn't admit me. Because I started thinking, one of my fears is that I'm alone. And I thought, if they admit me, then I bet some people will come see me. And if they think I'm dying, they're all going to come see me. I started thinking that if, if people thought I were dying and I got admitted, there's some people that I wanted to reconcile with. I want to forgive them. But I want them to say they're sorry first. And I thought that they might do that. I, um, I like attention and sympathy. Because I'm afraid that, often I'm afraid, that I'm not really loved and I'm not really wanted. I'm afraid that those who love me will discover I'm not who they think I am and I'm afraid that those who don't love me I won't get a chance to fix that narrative for them. This is weird. I, I was thinking about my stepmother who I recently discovered had died. She was my stepmother from the age of 6 to 18. and She was not a nice person to me. And I would always fantasize that I would find her and I'd call her and I would tell her all the things I wish I'd had the courage to say when I was young. I'm afraid I'd noticed in this last season of my life this is crazy. I'm afraid to forgive. 
because I'm afraid to let go of that kind of power and control. You're going to notice that I think that fear has a lot to do with this idea of control. I asked some friends and some folks what some of their fears might be. One said, I'm afraid of my boss, the, my person who writes my paycheck. One said, I'm afraid I'll get in trouble. We, we processed that a little bit. Like, now, no, it, it, it. she said, it's, it's like just when I was a little kid. And I was afraid if I messed up and got in trouble. So I worked so hard to always be good and not get in trouble. And somehow that fear is still there. Uh, somebody said, I'm afraid of being insignificant. I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of still getting a spanking. I'm a, you know what one of my fears is? I'm afraid that I'm going to be at a, at a dinner party and somebody's going to say, hey, let's play Bible trivia. <laughs> Honest truth. Because I know that I'm supposed to know these things, and I know that I probably did know them, but I can guarantee you I will look so stupid when I can't answer them. Who died on the cross for our sins? Oh, God, I know that name. I know that name. But it's, you know, I mean, it's, I, it's just a fear. Here, here's what's interesting. You know that fear or courage, I mean, yeah, fear or courage on these two spectra, they're not rational, right? We know they're not rational. I mean, even take my big fear that I'm going to be, you know, having to play Bible trivia. What's the worst that could happen? Like, what's the worst that can happen? How many of you, this is one of my favorites, I love this. It's true for me. How many of you pray if you're going to be on an airplane right before it takes off? Oh, yeah. We all do, oh, Lord. You know, you're making up sins to confess. You just want to be sure. But how many of you, when you get in the car, right, go, oh, Lord, help me get to the store? Oh, God, I'm so scared. You know where this is going, right? Statistically, by an astronomical number, what is more likely to be the cause of your death? Driving to the store. Why do I feel like driving to the store does not require a long prayer and confession? But flying does. So what? Go to the store all the time. Who's driving when I go to the store? Who's flying that plane? You better hope it ain't me, right? Control. There's something about control. I can't control my boss if he's going to pay me. I can't control if somebody's going to love or like me. I can't control if somebody's going to think I'm a fraud. I can't control that. Fear is this sense that I've lost control. When we were first married, I thought my wife would enjoy some of my shenanigans. And I remember she was in the laundry room getting stuff out of the washer, and in the trash there was a little piece of that lint that, you know, that comes out of the dryer. And I thought, she's going to think this is funny. And so I slid it across the, the linoleum floor, and when it got to her feet, I just yelled, Mouse! <laughs> Do you know anyone who's ever died of a mouse? It's not rational. But you don't know where that mouse is going to go. You don't know where he's gonna, what he's going to do. Fear isn't rational. In our story here, over and over, God is asking us, and asking Joshua, but we're listening in, so we know it's for us also. He says to him, I want you to be courageous. Well, what does that mean? In my world, courageous means a person 
who has no fear. In my mind, that's, that's the, 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 the war hero who seems to have no fear. But if I have to wait in my life to have no fear before I can be courageous, I'm afraid I'll have to wait forever. You see, I don't think God is telling us to change a feeling. I don't think he's saying that you, you, you're going to no longer have that part of your brain, the amygdala they call it, which has been sort of conditioned since I was a little kid. I'm one of those who's afraid to get hit. My, my dad was 6'3", 400 pounds, and he did a lot better job than his dad. But my dad had this habit of when we irritated him, he would thump us in the head. And so all of a sudden, you don't know what you're doing, and you're, up on, you know, you're kind of waking up off the floor. So I've always been afraid to not irritate 6'3", 400-pound men. Even at age 61, I still sometimes have that fear. Courage is this ability to simply, even though I might be feeling something, courage and do not fear is do not act on that. Do not cower from that. Do not shrink away. Don't be small. But trust. But trust. There's lots of places in the Bible where we're asked to be courageous, we're, we're asked to have faith, we're asked to believe. A lot of times, a word that might be easier for us to conceive is just this idea of trust. Now you'd say, how do I know <laughs> that I can trust God? I mean, isn't God asking Joshua and all those people to do something that is unprecedented? You, I don't, you could tell maybe if you were listening that this land to which they have been promised and will inhabit is not empty. It, it's not like they're looking at apartments and it's all cleaned up and nobody's there. They will have to do the eviction. And that's not going to be a It's not going to be a very clean process, they understand. How do I know that if God says that I have to trust, how do I know I can trust him? There's a couple of very quick and simple ways that I think I've noticed in this. One, God says, you just be you. Moses is dead. Have you ever had a person to whom you feel like you are constantly compared. And when you have that feeling, my hunch is you don't feel like you're doing much better. Maybe it was a sibling, a friend, a co-worker. And the idea is, the, 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 the anxiety is that I need to look like them. I putting myself in Joshua's shoes, I can't imagine what it would be like to be the replacement for Moses. Moses is with Abraham, probably in the Old Testament, the two most famous people there are. The most stories are told about them. Moses is going to show up later on on this thing called the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Moses is the man. And if I were Joshua, I would be afraid that everybody's going to compare me to Moses. And how could I be that? So God says, hey, Moses is dead. Let it go. But here's the one that I think is most significant. If while you were in exile... If while you were wandering in the wilderness, if I was just as with you then, as when you think you're doing the things I want you to do, I will be with you. But if I'm with you when you're not doing the things I particularly would want you to do, when I'm with you as much as I could ever be, 
You see, in this wandering, during the day there was what? A pillar, right? And at night there was what? A cloud of fire. In other words, every single day, while we're wandering and and somehow living through the process of not being who we thought we should be, God is there. Now, what do you eat in a wilderness when you got thousands and thousands and thousands of people to feed? You eat manna. Maybe you've never heard of manna. I don't know what it tastes like, but I know it appears every day as much as I need. So every single day, I'm reminded that God is with me. One of the most consistent promises in all of Scripture is some form of this. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Let's imagine for a moment that Joshua says, I can't do this. I can't go in. I won't go in. The reason I ask is because if I were to ask you to imagine a time in your life when you knew that God wanted you to do something, not the thing we'd like to talk about, and you said no. In that moment, God is no farther from you than if you had said yes. The yes is not for God. It's for us. You see, the story of the Bible, one of the big stories, is simply a story of life and death. And death, living in death, is when I'm in control. I'm scared, I'm hidden, I'm small. I'm afraid, and life is when I simply trust. Life isn't because I've accomplished something. Life comes throughout the Bible when I simply stop trying in a way. I stop pretending, I stop acting, and I simply trust. I trust that he's the one that's gonna go before me. He's the one that will fight the battle. If I was with you in the wilderness, if I was with you when you were drunk on your butt, if I was with you when you were gorging on porn or eating a whole cake, if I was with you then, no less than I will be with you if you were the best Christian who ever lived. Won't you trust me? I don't know how you feel about these things. I had a dream last night. Now, it's not that uncommon that I have a dream when I'm about to preach somewhere. Truthfully, I will always have some anxiety about it. Last night, I got up and ate a quart of ice cream. It didn't help, but once again, I thought it might. (laughs) But in this dream, and I have these dreams, like, like I said, like I was telling Peter, I've had a very, I have had one recurring dream. I don't, I really don't have nightmares, but I've had this one dream, and this is the honest truth. I was in a, what's called Bible college. Bible college is where you would go because I wanted to go into ministry, and, and in Bible college, we had, um, there was a couple of tracks you could take. One was to be, a, you could be a pastor, but to be a pastor, you had to take Greek and Hebrew, which are these foreign languages that nobody will ever use again. And I thought, that's kind of silly. So I went to a different track, but you still had to learn how to teach. So that's called pedagogy. The difference between the pedagogy class and the preaching class is simply volume. Preaching you yell, teaching you don't. So I was in the teaching class. Honest truth, it was my day to teach. We were all assigned a a passage 
It was out of the book of Philippians. I still remember. I was in the first chapter. And this is the dream. I am walking. (laughs) I'm walking up to where the class is. And like we, you know, I would be with my friends. They were all visible to me in the dream. And I have my Bible open to Philippians 1. And I'm asking everybody, what do you think this really means? What do you think I should say? What I like, I'm walking up there and I have no idea what I'm going to say. Second dream I've had that's recurring is I'm up preaching and people have this very puzzled look on their face. And I stop preaching and I say, what's going on? They said, you preached that last week. (laughs) I had a story one time I was telling. I had that look. I said, what's going on? They said, you told that last week. So I have reason for the, that's not how this dream went last night. I'm sorry I digress. This is, this is crazy. I, I don't know if I can explain it in a way that would impact you in the way that impacted me, but I was preaching this passage. I was talking about this. And all of a sudden, I began to, pre- I began to sort of yell to this, there was people kind of everywhere. It, wasn't, it didn't look like this, but there was people listening, and I was, <laughs> this is embarrassing, I was standing literally like on one, a soapbox kind of a thing, like it was a little stand, and I was standing up there. And I began, I began to tell this story, and people began to say, but, but what about, but what about discipline, somebody said. What about, the Bible says we're going to get disciplined if we don't, you know, kind of toe the line. I go, yes, isn't that awesome? Discipline means that God is with me. God is helping me. Punishment is God doesn't want anything to do with me. But discipline means he's really invested in what's going on. That he will transform anything that's bad into a part of my life story that's redeeming. It will be life, not death. People say, but what about if I I don't want to love him? I said, isn't that awesome? And I kept saying over and over, it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. And people kept responding. And all I could say, it's too good to be true. And then the whole crowd, this is the honest truth, never happened to me in my whole life. Everybody was listening to me, and we all were chanting, it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. There's only one promise I can give you in the scripture. I cannot tell you your life is gonna go the way you thought it's gonna go. As a matter of fact, I can probably guarantee you it won't. I can guarantee you that in my own life at 61, in your life, you are probably not sitting here going, yep, this is exactly how I thought it was gonna be. I bet you've hurt more than you ever thought you could hurt. I can't promise you you're not gonna hurt. I can't promise you're not going to face unbelievable challenges and and pain, but I can promise you this. Regardless of your choices, he will never leave you or forsake you. Every place that you put your foot, everywhere you go, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. It just seems too good to be true. Hey, let's pray together. I want you to, we'll just, let me take a breath and let's just pause for a moment together. And I can think of some things in my own life very recently where I just had, I just said no. I wish I hadn't. I wish I hadn't. Because I know that's just death. It's just me wanting to be in charge. But as we face today and tomorrow and this week, let's imagine for a moment that whatever you're facing, whatever is challenging you, we will together say, You'll never leave me. I can never, ever be alone. Lord, I think you tell us that our ability to trust you, that even that is a gift from you. 
that you've given us everything we need. Oh Lord, help that be enough for me. Lord, help me tire. (laughs) Help me be tired of my control. Lord, this issue that I'm struggling with forgiveness, oh God, I'm tired of it. And I want I want to be a person who's forgiving. I know that you have lavished on me unbelievable grace and forgiveness. I'm just scared. I'm scared that if I let go of some kind of control that I won't be able to fix what's happened. Oh God, help me give up the idea that I can fix anything that's happened. Lord, I'm I'm beyond words. In fact, I can't even say it. I can only dream it. It's just too good to be true that you'll never leave me. Because of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Carl. On the night that Jesus was delivered up. And I should mention this. Um, the name Joshua, if you were to say that in Jesus' day in, in Palestine, you'd say Yahshua or Yeshua. And then if you were to translate that into English, it would be the name Jesus. So Jesus and Joshua are the exact same word. And God said to Joshua, Jesus, Moses is dead. And Moses was a servant of the Lord, but you know, Moses received the law. And the law is knowledge of good and evil. And then he says, well, this is good and this is bad, so do this, do that. And, and the way it works is that you're in control, right, Carl? That's the living by the law, that you're in control. And God says to Joshua, Joshua, Jesus, Yeshua, Moses is dead. He's dead. And you're going to lead them into the land. You can't get into the land through the law. That's the big, big story in the Old Testament. It's Yeshua that takes you in. The name Yeshua, Joshua, means God is salvation. And Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so as you come to the table this morning, you're acting out Carl's sermon Um, You're acting out the gospel. Jesus is saying, look, um, you're going to eat me. (laughs) And I'm like a seed. And I don't stay dead. I come to life. And I am your wisdom. It's not not knowledge that you take from a tree, but I'm your wisdom. And and that's, that's life that I give you from the tree. I'm your wisdom. I'm your righteousness. I'm every right decision that you make. I'm your wisdom, righteousness, your sanctification. I'm what makes you holy. And I'm uh, your redemption. And uh, trust me, because uh, I am in control. And I know where we're going. I know what we're doing. And uh, I, am, I am the love of God for you. So as you come to the table this morning, um, let Moses die. And uh, talk to Jesus, because he's with you. Amen. Oh, I need to say this too. This is why I'm doing communion. Sorry, Carl. Um, We're doing communion a little different this morning uh, because people have said, hey, we really miss how we did it before COVID messed us all up. And uh, the fact that the bread doesn't come from the table over and then and the wine and all that stuff. So this morning we're going to do it a little bit different. Um, You need to know that if you're worried about COVID, we have the uh, communion cups that are prepackaged and everything that have a little wafer on the top and you can just grab one of those. Uh, We also have bread that's cut up on a tray, and you can just take a piece of that bread and dip it in one of the one of the cups. And then we have um, then this bread will be there as well. If you want to tear it off and dip it in, that's great, too. If you want juice, the only juice is in those prepackaged cups. All right. So on the night that Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua was betrayed, he took bread and he said, this is my body given to you. Take and eat, ingest this, and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the covenant, the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So if you're going to forgive, I'll do it through you. 
take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. So he's calling you to his table. Um, Joshua is our Lord Jesus. Amen. Peter's going to come up after I read the benediction. And also to remind you that if you'd like to come and, and sort of visualize yourself at the river of life flowing through you, and you would want somebody to pray with you or just to be alone, that you're also in, invited to that. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has now become the cornerstone. And there is no rescue, there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given among people by which we can be saved. Amen.